<clears throat> now we're moving on to our last lecture, Contemporary Art of the Diaspora. So the first artist we'll look at, and we're going to be looking at mostly Black American contemporary artists in this section, uh, but we'll look at one British artist as well. Um, this is Lorna Simpson and her piece called Necklines. Uh, so what Simpson likes to do is to create imagery, um, mostly including, almost always, exclusively including Black people, sometimes herself, as in this one, uh, and then putting words next to it um, and trying to um, create conversations about how the words and text, um, how the words and text work with the imagery. Um, so one of the books I used to teach from in an art appreciation class um, talked about the violent subtext of the African American experience in relationship to this word, work. So what I would do is kind of like, uh, if you can, take to the extra credit board uh, and take a look at this imagery uh, and then take a look at the words and think about the multiple meanings of the words and see if you agree that it fits in with the violent subtext of African American experience. And also try to look at things that don't necessarily have to do with violence, but have to do with modern things that people have to deal with. Um, sometimes not just black people, but also um, other people as well, um, but certainly concentrate on black people. So this piece is from 1989. Um, so you might want to like look up some of the words <laughs> since it may, may refer to slang that you don't necessarily know the meaning of. Um, so looking at our next piece um, called the park, uh, as you can see, this is a giant piece. piece. It's a serigraph, which means a silk screen on six felt panels. Uh, so this would be kind of huge. And um, I think a good way to look at this particular piece is to show how it is in um, when it's displayed and exhibited. So let's take a look at that. So this is the piece, uh, and this was what it would look like. Um, it's taken from uh, her Simpsons um, apartment uh, that overlooks Central Park. Um, I think it might be her studio, though. Uh, and this is 1995, so even then, <laughs> it, was, it was a pretty difficult thing to get an apartment with this type of view. Um, so that's kind of telling you something right away. Um, other things you should know about New York is that um, New York is um, pretty heavily gentrified now, uh, and except for some pockets um, in Queens, uh, Manhattan, and Brooklyn, um, generally has made it difficult for poor people or disadvantaged people to live there. Um, in 1995, wasn't necessarily the case. There was still, um, you could still survive um, and not be as well off. Um, other things is that if you've ever lived in New York or visited with people, not just like staying in a hotel, you may notice that um, everything is just kind of out there. Uh, when you look out your window, you're seeing in a bunch of other people's windows. Um, when you get on the subway, um, there's people making out right next to you. Uh, so people kind of are forced in a way uh, to um, give up a certain amount of privacy um, but, you know, are able to create privacy just by everyone respecting um, each other's spaces. Um, so in the park, it has two different descriptions. Uh, and since the left to right is a pretty logical way to go, let's start with the one on the left. So the first one says, just unpacked a new shiny silver telescope, and we're up high enough for a really good view of all the buildings in the park. The living room window seems to be the best spot for it. On the sidewalk below, a man watches from across the path. So try to think about what kind of imagery is going through your head. Um, who do you think this is? Do you think this is have some emotion to it? Uh, what kind of emotions are there? Then you can move on to the one on the right. It is the early evening. The lone sociologist walks through the park to observe private acts in men's public bathrooms. These facilities are men's and women's rooms back to back. He focuses on the layout of the men's room, right to left, basin, urinal, 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 stall, stall. He decides to adopt the role of voyeur and look out in order to go unnoticed 
and noticed at the same time. His research takes several years. He names his subjects A, B, C, X, Y, and O, records their activities for now, and their license plates when applicable for later. Um, so think about this story, um, where you're being placed in the picture, um, and how this affects you. What do you think about this lone sociologist? Um, do you think he's uh, just doing work that sociologists do, or do you feel like there's something else going on? Um, so with this one, she's kind of looking at the way, again, that we can relate to imagery, or you may see something relatively innocent or childlike, um, and then um, when we apply it to a picture, um, you know, it has these kind of like positive feelings, but then when we apply different words to it, then it may get perhaps more sinister. So moving on to Chris O'Feely, uh, as you can see, he's born in 1968. So we quite we haven't quite got to artists that are younger than me yet, but we will. So he's a British son of Nigerian immigrants, and um, he lived in Manchester. Uh, and Manchester is a city that, if you don't know anything about the UK, may be difficult to understand. Uh, but luckily, you live in a city that relatively similar to Manchester in some ways, uh, as well as Birmingham is also similar to it in some ways. Uh, and that is Detroit. <laughs> so Manchester is um, famous for having a working class environment, um, having a very um, large population of pe people who are oppressed in a particular country, um, and having a pretty great music scene as well. So, um, and a lot of flowering of cultures um, from, from oppressed people. And um, Chris O'Feely, along with some other artists, uh, including the world's wealthiest artist, Damien Hirst, was part of a group called the Young British Artists. Um, so when he was in school, uh, him and some of the other artists uh, were looking at what their futures were. And some of you, if you're in fine art, you may be looking at this as well and say, well, what do we have to do? Uh, we have to create these works while we're in school uh, and then smooth with these like um, with kind of like wealthy or bourgeois people uh, and convince them to buy our artwork and then just do that forever. Uh, and a lot of artists say, well, I mean, that's what you have to do. Other artists could say it's kind of limiting. Um, I don't feel like I can do the content that I want to do in this way. Uh, so the young British artists thought, well, let's do this a different way. Um, so while they were in school, they instead um, used warehouses, um, like parties, um, which later came to be called rave parties. Um, not by me, I don't remember when I was young, anyone calling them raves, we just called them parties. Uh, and you would have musicians, especially DJs, uh, in separate rooms in a warehouse. A lot of times you wouldn't even like rent the warehouse, you'd just move into one that wasn't being used. Uh, and you could have these different sorts of music and people would have this big party, um, sometimes with lots of drugs, but it was basically a way to, to have this social scene that was new and separate from older people and their influence uh, and was a way to kind of like create culture. Um, so they took that and said, yeah, we should do that. We'll get um, a warehouse. We'll put different artists in different rooms. And what do they do? Whatever they want. Um, and so the idea was to be able to kind of break out of this paradigm of just trying to get um, wealthier people to buy your stuff uh, and instead trying to support each other. So despite their best efforts, um, Saatchi, uh, who is, owns one of the most prominent galleries in Britain, uh, saw these artists uh, and saw some of their shows, um, their parties, and started to buy up their work. <clears throat> so um, Saatchi supported artists like Damien Hirst and Chris Ophelia, and that's part of the reason why they were able to get uh, where they are internationally. Uh, so as a young man, um, Ophelia was growing up. Uh, he wasn't necessarily uh, connected to the experiences of his parents as Nigerian immigrants, uh, but he did want to get connected with Africa. 
Uh, so he visited Zimbabwe in 1992 with a British Council grant. And while he was there, he spent time with some people that we had talked about earlier. Uh, and he was really inspired by their art and by the way they lived. Um, he saw that they were living in this very difficult environment and they took everything that was available to them um, to try to survive and hopefully thrive in this environment. So the first thing I want you to do before I give you a description of this piece is just tell me what you see. So pause the video uh, and either in the extra credit board or just to yourself, what can you recognize here? So once you've done that, come back and I'll show you the title. Um, so it's called The Holy Virgin Mary, uh, but you probably notice a few other things uh, like the butts from pornography uh, and this cut out of magazines um, back when I guess they had magazines for pornography. Uh, you can see the Mary-like figure, we can tell by um, the flower association, so these petals coming down, um, the blue cloak that she's wearing, uh, the rose which is associated with Mary. But there's also um, associations with the figure itself uh, as far as racial imagery that Ophelia had been exposed to. Um, the background mimics gold leaf, but as you can see, uh, there's kind of an incredible uh, amount of materials. So we have paper, collage, oil paint, glitter, polyester resin. Um, we have map pins and elephant dung on linen. Um, so I'll kind of show you how the elephant dung looks in a moment. Um, this show was originally part of Sensation, the young British artist from the Saatchi collection at the British Museum. And um, I'll just kind of uh, go a little bit forward so we can see some things. So this is the way it was originally displayed. Uh, so it was sitting on the floor and you had two pieces of elephant dung. One says Virgin, one says Mary, and then the um, rose is also made from elephant dung. Uh, so let's go back again. Um, so Visona, I think, does uh, a really bad job in this part in respecting what artists have to do uh, and what some of their meanings are. Um, and unfortunately, uh, I think you see kind of a pattern when talking about contemporary artists uh, that um, Visona is not um, considering black artists to be some, something um, beyond black artists. Uh, and we'll kind of talk about what this catch-22 is or paradox um, with black artists um, as we go along in this section. Uh, so just realize that I don't really agree with what she's saying. Uh, she says, as the exhibitors had hoped, Ophelia's painting was considered to be an offensive work of blasphemy. Uh, and I don't think that's the case. Uh, I think it's more complex than that. Um, so the dung spells Virgin and Mary. Uh, and what Ophelia says about it is that the paintings themselves are very delicate abstractions and wanted to bring their beauty and decorativeness together with the ugliest, ugliness of shit so that people uh, can't ever feel comfortable with it. So one of the things that he was influenced by, his parents were both Christians, um, he is a Christian, uh, he grew up and went to Catholic school. Um, and when he saw paintings like this, which is very similar to a painting at the DIA, where you see the Virgin Mary um, breastfeeding Jesus, um, he saw like something kind of like interesting and contradictory. Um, so he said, as an altar boy, I was confused by the idea of a Holy Virgin Mary giving birth to a young boy. Now, when I go to the National Gallery and see the paintings of the Virgin Mary, I see how sexually charged they are. Mine is simply a hip hop version. Um, so he's playing with a few ideas, um, the idea that he talked about first, so that's why he puts the Virgin Mary uh, next to all of this pornography. Um, he's also playing with the idea of the Madonna whore. Uh, this is um, an idea that sort of comes from Freudianism, but I'm not sure if you would agree with it. Um, the idea that men uh, in heterosexual men desire in their partners a woman like the Virgin Mary who is pure and innocent before they meet them, but then once they get married to them, uh, they want them to be able to satisfy their every sexual need. Um, so he's kind of working with both of these. Um, and so it's, it's kind of like a, a complex feeling. On one hand, 
he's got Christianity. Uh, you know, he loves Christianity, but he also sees that Christianity had been a tool of colonialism. So there's that conflict there. Uh, he's, he sees the beauty uh, and innocence, but also eroticism. Uh, so he kind of explores that conflict there. Um, but when it showed uh, in Brooklyn, um, many people were angry. Uh, many right-wing political figures like Rudy Giuliani, who at that time was the um, district attorney, uh, took advantage of this uh, to try to talk against this evil um, work of blasphemy coming from these you know, awful left-wing artists and such. And um, they took him to court, uh, and Giuliani hoped to uh, take away this show because it was um, supported uh, partially by a grant uh, by the National Endowment for the Arts, which is a government program. And um, he failed. Uh, the court said that, you know, this is clearly within uh, what the NEA can do. Uh, and this type of censorship would be um, a bad idea. It's, you know, considered to be a work of art and talked about some of the meanings and such. Um, so they failed in that way, but they did drum up uh, the intention, which was um, to get people angry uh, about um, black artists, artists that are coming from the left or as they perceive it, um, and also just the idea of arts funding in general. Uh, so in this way, um, they kind of spoke to their core audience with that. So a member of their core audience, <laughs> Scott Levado, uh, and, you know, needless to say he's white, but uh, we'll move on here. Um, he had this idea when he saw it that this is blasphemy and I'm going to do something about it. Um, he put shit on the Virgin Mary. Well, I'm going to put shit on them. So his, his intent was to go to the Brooklyn Museum uh, with some horse manure and throw it on the Ophelia painting. Um, but unfortunately, when he came with his container, his bag of horse manure, uh, security sniffed him out even before he reached the steps. <laughs> so he desperately tried to throw the horse manure at the steps of the museum outside and just hit nothing <laughs> except concrete. Uh, and then he was arrested. Um, but he was able to parlay uh, being arrested because he himself was an artist. And you can check out his website if that's your thing. Um, into a, a career of making um, patriotic patriotic art, as he calls it, um, and meaning you know heavily right wing type of art. Uh, when nine eleven happened, uh, he was able to make quite a good living painting flags, uh, American flags everywhere. Um, so, <laughs> I think that's a, a compliment to Ophelia and the power of his art, in that uh, another artist uh, made their career on trying to interact and failing to with uh, some of his art. So some of the other sources for the images are again talking about contradictions. Um, this one, uh, the image that he uses for the Virgin Mary um, is based on gollywogs. And gollywogs are like the type of racist imagery that you would see in the United States, um, especially after the end of slavery. Uh, with these kind of stock black characters trying to show black people as violent or simplistic or um, animalistic. Uh, and that's kind of how the gollywogs functioned in the UK and in the African states in the, in the UK that, uh, that Britain had colonized. Um, so this is originally a cartoon, and it continued to ran in the 20th century despite using these racist imageries and these dolls these gollywogs were sold. Um, so again, it's, it's similar to the racist imagery that you would see um, from used against black people in the United States. So showing very dark skin, uh, very red lips, uh, you know, big eyes and, and caricatured hair and outfits and such. So what I found uh, particularly disturbing is that this picture was taken in 2008. And this was being sold um, on the counter of a UK, and it looks to be uh, some type of art supply store. Um, so that kind of tells you that this imagery, uh, despite many people looking at it as being the past, uh, still exists. And even 
even to the extent that you don't see it being sold, the imagery still has an effect on how black people are treated um, in colonized countries. So this one, uh, No Woman, No Cry, um, refers to a couple of things. You might recognize that it refers to a Bob Marley tune. Um, so Ophelia in 1998, he won the, won the uh, Turner Prize, which is basically a big cash grant that you can use to put into your artwork, or sometimes the artist will give it to others, um, or put it into like you know community programs or whatnot. And this shows more evidence because there's elephant dung here um, that he clearly didn't mean simply blasphemy uh, when he was making it. Part of the reason why he was attracted to elephant dung is because when he was among the San people uh, in Zimbabwe, he noticed that they use elephant dung in a lot of different ways, uh, including as fuel. Uh, and to him, this is a way to kind of connect things uh, to um, the San people who we talked about before, who are kind of like an original people type of people. So he wanted to kind of connect um, to this idea of an original people. But this one, he's talking about something that's clearly not blasphemy. He's talking about something else. Uh, when we get in close, we can see the tears that are falling um, from the figure's eyes. And I have a picture on the inside. And it's Stephen Lawrence, who was a Jamaican immigrant murdered in London. Uh, so the diaspora community of black people in London um, is treated in a similar way to what you see in big cities and urban environments in the United States. Um, there is a lot of police violence uh, against black people, uh, especially um, people living in poor neighborhoods. Um, and that kind of like constant violence, they can kind of act as an occupying army. Um, and within that, you'll occasionally see uh, white supremacist groups um, who will take advantage of the police's general um, antagonistic view towards um, black neighborhoods and, and even non-black neighborhoods um, to uh, be able to do whatever they want uh, and know that uh, the police won't do anything about it. So uh, when Lawrence was murdered, uh, many witnesses said that um, we saw the people who did it. Um, they were wearing these jackets from this particular white supremacist organization. Um, then the cops came in, investigated, and they couldn't find anything. Even though it's like literally it was written on their backs uh, who these people were. Uh, but um, as often is the case, um, there was quite a bit of overlap between these white supremacist groups and police. So we're anti-immigrant groups sometimes. They're, they're called both in America and in Europe, but they're, they're white supremacist groups. Um, so people in London uh, saw this, uh, black people especially saw this as part of a pattern of police violence uh, and oppression and state oppression against black people and a failure to um, protect when needed. Uh, so... Some people, they didn't know what to do, uh, but um, Doreen Lawrence, uh, who was the mother of the figure of um, Stephen, um, perhaps she is the one pictured here. Um, perhaps she's a more generalized uh, person who is dealing, a black woman who is dealing with the pain of um, police violence and, and um, kind of like economic uh, violence against black people in general. Um, so perhaps it's a portrait of Doreen Lawrence who didn't want to take this lack of investigation uh, against her son's murder, for her son's murder, um, sitting down. So she protested, she got together with lawyers, she worked on trying to make it happen. Um, he was still, his murders were still never prosecuted. Uh, but, you know, it's kind of seen as someone who is working towards liberation and getting people to talk about things and working together. Um, so what's interesting is that if you've ever heard of the Google Art Gigapixel um, project, um, what it was, it was developed um, at Google like quite a few years ago um, when uh, people had started to develop in the late 90s, early 2000s, extremely high resolution um, digital imaging devices. Um, and they're able to create these incredibly high resolution gigapixel images. 
Uh, so Google kind of worked with some people to make these images available to everyone. And they used um, this picture by Chris Ophelia, No Women, No Cry, as the first Google Art pic gigapixel image. And you can kind of see why. You can um, go to this link, just go to Google Art Gigapixel and look up No Women, No Cry. And you can check out how it works. My computer's too slow, it may crash on it. Uh, but that's how I was able to get this incredibly close up image. Uh, and you, so you can kind of see why they would pick this image. Um, Ophelia's works are extremely detailed. Uh, they're basically um, collages or mosaics. Uh, so this is the perfect kind of format to show the type of art that he makes. So we had other pieces in a series, again, as you can see, supported by Elephant Dung. Um, so Double Captain Shit and The Legend of the Black Stars. Um, Ophelia talks about the dung as a way of raising the paintings up from the ground and giving them a feeling that they've come from the earth rather than simply being hung on a wall. So he's working with a few different references. One is Luke Cage, and I heard the, the TV series now is pretty cool. Um, Luke Cage was one of the first black comic book heroes, uh, and as a result, um, that is a figure that a lot of black people, especially young black people, would associate with, and we're glad to see um, black people being portrayed as superheroes. Um, but uh, there was also kind of like another side and that sometimes the portrayal would work with stereotypes of black men, uh, that they're hypersexualized or um, very big. You can kind of see how Luke Cage is portrayed as being larger and more muscular uh, than the other figure. Um, and also, you know, sometimes working with imagery, which is uh, imagery that's created sometimes by black people, like black exploitation imagery. Um, so film series, you can kind of look that up. Um, but also maybe a little bit of a problem because there's a lot of white artists that are creating this. So um, a certain amount of heroism, a uh, certain amount of positives and negatives. Uh, and as you can see, Luke Cage is wearing this very like 70s outfit uh, with the tights and boots. Uh, so we see that mirrored in Double Captain Shit. Um, and Double Captain Shit is also kind of like an Elvis type of figure uh, in that he doesn't have Luke Cage's body anymore. Uh, he's still wearing the jumpsuit, but you know things are kind of falling out a little bit and everyone's observing him. Um, so uh, Chris Ophelia is talking about like, you know, again, kind of contradictions that he's trying to bring up here. Uh, my project is not a PC, politically correct project. It's my direct link to black exploitation. I'm trying to make you things you can laugh at, allows you to laugh about issues that are potentially serious. So the way that Ophelia is using um, politically correct at this time is different than the way it's used nowadays. Mostly political, politically correct is used by right-wingers um, to frankly uh, talk about uh, people who are mad about them saying racist things. Uh, Chris Ophelia is not coming from that way because at that time, um, you would say politically correct as in you're bringing up issues that people are uncomfortable with. So if you talk about race, um, that's not PC because people don't want to hear about that. Um, so he's kind of working with that, this figure who may be falling off over the years um, and everyone's looking at him and he can feel those looks, you know. Uh, and this can kind of mirror um, what not just like black celebrities have to deal with, but celebrities in general, certainly, um, but black artists as well. Uh, and this is the kind of catch-22 of black artists. Um, on one hand, if you're a black artist, you can make work that resonates with your identity, with your background. And then when you get into galleries, when you get into exhibitions, um, you're going to be labeled an identity artist. And that will draw a nice little box around you. Uh, and you'll exhibit with other identity artists. Uh, you know, sometimes black, sometimes other people of color, um, but you're always going to be considered to be that. Uh, and people obviously want to do art uh, if it's personal that has to do with our identity, uh, but it limits um, what the artist can do. So on the other hand, the black artist or a black scholar or anyone working in these kind of um, professional fields can say, okay, well, it works outside of that. If they're a black artist, they'll work in some kind of um, Western tradition and not necessarily show 
their identity. And this might be because they're really interested in that and they would like to do that, or a black scholar who's studying like the European Renaissance or something like that. Um, and then you'll be constantly compared to um, white artists or white scholars, uh, and it will say, you know, this isn't quite, you know, what uh, other people are doing. They won't recognize your contributions to the work. Um, so you'll be stuck kind of there. Uh, and people will always be looking for that other box. Um, so it creates a very, as um, Campbell says, a dilemma. So black artists in Britain at the time faced the usual dilemma. Work that touched on just about any aspect of our lived experience was dismissed as dealing with black issues, or as the euphemism still has it, identity. Work that didn't was seen as derivative of our white peers. The context for our work was completely determined by our racial character, and to insist that the work be viewed on its own merits was doomed to failure. Uh, so black artists um, and other artists from oppressed groups have to deal with um, being literally dehumanized. Uh, they can't be fully humans that are working in professional um, ways because there's limits to how they are considered in the work that they um, are considered to be able to do. Um, so black artists, black scholars uh, just have to kind of like mediate between these expectations uh, and what they feel from themselves. Uh, and that creates a lot of difficulty. Um, so some artists look at this mediation uh, and they make it one of their primary themes in their work. Uh, and that's Kara Walker, who is still younger than me, but not by much, uh, born in 1969. Here she is pictured there uh, quite a few years ago. Uh, she changed her hair around a lot. So if you've seen her recently, she may look differently. So she says that one of my earliest memories involves sitting on my dad's lap in a studio in the garage of our house and watching him draw. I remember thinking, I want to do that too. And I pretty much decided then and there at the age of two and a half and three that I was an artist just like dad. Um, so Kara Walker was born in Stockton, California. And if you know anything about California, uh, there's very few black people there. Uh, and, and a couple of neighborhoods in Los Angeles uh, and in Oakland, California, that's where most black people live. Uh, so she would definitely be um, not as in touch uh, with black communities. Um, so she moved to the South at 13, uh, and her father was a teacher at GSU, uh, an art teacher. Um, and as she said, it, as a kid, she decided to do that herself. Uh, she got a BFA at the Atlanta College of Art. And then from that, she got into the Harvard of Design Schools uh, at RISD, the Rhode Island uh, Institute of, of Design. And um, she got her MFA there. Uh, while she was getting her MFA, she started to do this silhouette cut work that's in this picture and that we'll look at a little bit more. Um, and started to get attention for it, uh, was exhibiting. Uh, people were fascinated by her work and had never seen anything quite like it. Uh, and she, was, she got the MacArthur Green Genius Grant at the age of 27. At the time, she was the youngest recipient of this grant. Um, since then, there was a Korean mathematician, I think, that had got this. So this uh, genius grant, I put it in quotes because I don't think anyone like <laughs> gets these beliefs in the concept of genius. Uh, it's all work, as they say. Uh, but what it does is it gives you a bunch of money. So um, basically, the message is keep working. Uh, you know, keep doing what you're doing. Um, but you know, you still gotta got get paid, so she became a professor at Columbia. Uh, and there she met a friend of mine, a photographer named Diane Waugh. Uh, I'll put her Instagram, Diane's Instagram um, and website in the comments for this video. Uh, Diane became a student at Columbia, uh, also in the MFA program in photography, uh, and she worked with Kara Walker. Uh, so before uh, I first taught this class, uh, I asked Diane if she had anything to share with me that I couldn't necessarily find out about any other way. Uh, she did so, so I'll kind of go over that as we're talking about this art. So big old warning with Kara Walker, uh, her art, when you first see it, it has this kind of beauty and delicacy, uh, but when you get into it, it's talking about some very difficult subjects, uh, and they can feel very personal because they certainly do to her. Uh, so let's check these out. 
So this one's called The Means to an End, Shadow Drama in Five Acts. Now she's making these work. She's very precisely cutting out, uh, this kind of maddeningly precise, uh, these silhouettes uh, and then um, arranging them. Sometimes she'll do different arrangements depending on where it's being exhibited uh, to create these narratives. Uh, so in this one, you know, quite explicit about being a narrative, a shadow drama in five acts. And um, for Walker, who are used to the silhouette, once used for portraits and caricatures and primarily a decorative craft, is an effective way of simplifying complex ideas. She likens it to stereotyping in which individual identities, situations, and personalities are reduced and distorted into easily caricatured forms. So if you kind of take the title and you try to make the shadow, shadow drama happen, uh, and I encourage you to pause the video and see if you can get some narratives out of it. Um, there isn't like a hyper-specific narrative, but there's certainly ones that um, I commonly see people interpreting. Uh, so what I commonly see is, um, this is during slavery times, uh, we have this stereotypical racially charactered black woman um, right here, uh, and she's breastfeeding a white child. Um, we see another white child on a pony uh, who's kind of running away and putting her hand up and pining towards um, the black woman um, and the white boy. So uh, during when black people were enslaved, uh, there were often um, black wet nurses and they would take care of the wealthy slave owner's kids uh, and they would have this um, relationship with them basically be their mothers. So then we get to perhaps another part of the drama and we see these figures again, racially characters, uh, black figures, um, and we see um, what seems to be a dancing white figure above literally dancing on the heads of um, black people. Uh, so many people interpret it as this same woman. Uh, this is a, her as a little girl and this is a woman. Uh, and she's kind of like taking out her resentment at the crush she had in the little boy and the jealousy she felt for the black woman um, against um, slaves. Uh, so then we move on and most people interpret it this woman and this woman as being the same. She's looking up and what she's seeing is, and again, most people interpreted this man and this young boy as being the same. She's seeing this boy as a man um, who she took care of, um, taking his daughter uh, and seeming to very young daughter. Uh, and you know, perhaps this could be um, showing sexual assault or rape. Um, so this kind of shows some of the brutality of slavery. Um, on levels that are, isn't often talked about, uh, but it's talked about more often nowadays. Uh, the kind of sexual charge that went with it, the fact that um, American slavery, which was you completely owned um, people, uh, but everything about them. So you owned what they did. You owned um, their sexuality, literally. You could do whatever you wanted with their bodies. And I'm talking about the white slave owners. Um, and you owned all of their descendants. Um, so in this case, uh, you know, black people literally didn't have control over their own bodies or the bodies of their children. Um, so it's dealing with this like strange kind of environment where you have owners who on one hand um, have this, you know, or build up this sexually charged uh, kind of attitude towards black people uh, but also being very violent towards them. Um, so this combination is something that Kara Walker will often deal with in her work. So this piece uh, presented a problem um, during the Friends of the African and African American Art Show at the DIA in 1999. And uh, what happened is this was originally, this piece that we're looking at was originally supposed to be displayed and um, a big ruckus kind of built up. And um, eventually it was decided by the Friends of African and African American Art that they weren't gonna show this piece. And they had a write up on why they weren't gonna show the piece. And this is an excerpt from it, from Samuel Thomas, um, who's one of the friends. It's primarily because it's controversial and there's no clear art historical position with respect to Walker's work. 
Um, so this is going to take quite a bit of explanation. So um, at the time that this piece was being made, um, was being displayed in 1999, uh, there was still kind of a leftover in black communities, although you don't see it so much anymore, uh, but certainly in the older generation of this time, of this idea of respectability of politics. <clears throat> So respectability of politics refers to the idea um, that uh, for black people to be able to do better, um, they should um, look at the success mar markers of um, you know, modern society, uh, you know, kind of recognizing it as white, uh, but they should look at the success markers and strive towards that and that um, more examples should be shown of that and that if that is done, if black people can get college degrees uh, and get good jobs, um, become doctors and lawyers, uh, then um, that will uh, reduce oppression against black people, or at least to give them more protection. So uh, after I describe this, you probably, a lot of you are probably uh, see some obvious problems with this. Um, but just to give you another example, uh, probably the best example was a show that was on in the 1980s. Uh, the figure I'm going to talk about has different meaning nowadays, but maybe it's related, uh, called The Cosby Show. Uh, it was a television show that came out in the mid 80s. Uh, and Bill Cosby, who was already a famous comedian at that time, uh, who himself had, had advanced degrees, um, but you know had gotten to entertainment. Um, he created the show precisely from this point of view of respectability politics. He looked at his life and he's like, well, I've been able to do pretty well uh, by getting these advanced degrees and, and kind of working through and, um, you know, showing kind of a shining example. So that's what he made the Cosby show. It was about a couple or a family um, in Brooklyn. They lived in this, this really fancy brownstone in Brooklyn. Um, Bill Cosby played Cliff Huxtable, who was a physician. Uh, and then his wife was a lawyer. Uh, and then the, the show basically showed him and his kids occasionally um, issues that are specific to black people come up, but generally they would just show them as any um, kind of like upper middle class, professional class type of family uh, and the issues that are going on there. And people like Cosby and others believed that that was a way to show a good example. And that's what black people should be doing. But later, when you saw some of the things that Bill Cosby would say, uh, you kind of realize that that's coming from a different place uh, that may be very class-based. Uh, like Bill Cosby got in trouble uh, in the 2000s uh, saying that um, part of the reason why crime in black American communities is because like men are walking around with their pants falling down. Um, so a very clear kind of like um, class, uh, classes type of view uh, towards, um, you know, danger and crime in African-American neighborhoods. So people, uh, there was a little bit of a while where respectability politics was, was respected <laughs> by some in black communities, um, but generally you don't see it so much except among white right-wing conservatives, uh, and that's a way for them uh, to kind of deny the experience of black people. Occasionally, you'll, you'll see it come up in black communities. Uh, the Obamas are, are probably the best example. They will occasionally engage uh, in respectability politics. Um, so that's part of where the people who are angry with this were coming from. They're like, why do we have to judge up this imagery? We need to have positive imagery that shows people what they can be. Um, Walker, on the other hand, was like, you know, we can't um, unring that bell. Uh, and that ringing is still resonating and the material lives of black people. Um, so I think we got to take a look at it uh, and see if we can get something out of this conflict. But um, because, you know, it's coming from older people and a lot of them are donors, uh, it was removed. Uh, but other things, things got a little bit hairier. Um, so, the thing that Diane told me is that, that I couldn't find anywhere else is that uh, Walker received death threats. Um, so people were really angry um, because for reasons that 
if you're coming from a white perspective, um, you really shouldn't take a side on. Um, that's including me. Uh, so I kind of describe what the, uh, even though it's coming from a respectability politics and there's a disagreement, um, there also is like a real um, interest in um, not feeding white audiences excuses to be racist um, or kind of coupons. Uh, and Walker was aware of this um, and she kind of explores that in some of her later work. Um, so uh, the death threats, um, which may have been coming from white racists for all I know, um, they are, you know, coming from this place of like, this is a dangerous thing to, dangerous place to go. Uh, and, um, you know, coming from like a real care uh, for black people. So, but she continued these types of views uh, and exploring this like situation. I'm not going to say it's exactly Stockholm syndrome, uh, but the way that somebody, when they're in forced situations, the way they navigate these forced situations. Uh, so she uses imagery from slavery, uh, but again, she feels that these forced situations resonate in modern times. Uh, so she needs to kind of like look at this uh, and put it out there so people understand. So this one's called Slavery, Slavery, representing a grand, a lifelike panoramic journey into a picturesque Southern slavery or life at Old Virginia's Hole, sketches from plantation life. See the peculiar institution as never before, all cut from black paper by the able hand of Kara Elizabeth Walker, an emancipated negress and leader in her cause. Uh, so with this one, she's referring to a bunch of things. Uh, the peculiar institution is what um, propagandists in the South called slavery uh, because white people from the very beginning of slavery uh, and from the very beginning of the United States uh, who was, that ostensibly was founded on this idea of freedom recognize the contradiction between that uh, and that the freedom of you know white landowners uh, and that's it basically at the time was based on the brutal exploitation of black people and limiting their freedom. Uh, so they call it the cure institution to kind of like say, oh, but that's okay. Um, it's weird and it doesn't seem to fit, but, you know, we need it because business. Um, so she's talking about that. She uses words that are kind of 19th century ways uh, to separate and somewhat dehumanize black people. So negress, uh, but she's saying emancipated. Uh, so emancipated is like a word pregnant with meaning, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation, in theory, uh, freed the slaves, uh, but it just led to more complex um, ways to exploit black people and black labor over time. So this emancipation uh, wasn't a full emancipation, certainly. Um, so with this, she creates a story again with like kind of disturbing imagery, um, even talking about bodily functions, clearly sexual imagery, some ones that may be raped, they may be um, more complicated. Um, so she calls this show to kind of recognize those complications. Uh, rape is always rape, but talking about the feelings that people would have to deal with this, which means if you're someone that is in a situation where you have no, literally no control over your body, other people control your body and you're raped, um, you have to emotionally and mentally deal with what this is and what this means. Uh, and that can lead to contradictions, um, contradictions of even embracing uh, and mistaking um, this type of violence for love. So she recognizes, oh, only temporarily, no, nobody would mistake it permanently like that. Uh, my compliment, my enemy, my oppressor, my love. Uh, so showing this kind of impossible situation and the emotions that would come out of it. Uh, and for Walker, this is still resonant, um, even though it's post-slavery or post-Jim Crow. Um, so I'd highly recommend watching um, Ava DuVernay's 13th, uh, which I had linked in the previous video. I'll probably link it again in this one. I think you can get an idea on how some of this imagery develops uh, that Kara Walker uses. Uh, so again, these kind of like phantasmagorias that she's fond of creating, um, these like weird and bizarre uh, sexual imagery, um, contradictions, uh, all of these things together. Uh, so this one's called Grub for Sharks, Concession to Negro Populace. Um, so this is also very complex and contradictory and has to do with um, 
Walker's experience and experience she sees in others in mediating um, her Black identity and, and Black identity in general. Uh, so it was inspired by quite a few things. Um, Kara Walker's uh, kind of like, imagine that nerd kid who like, you knew in school, uh, who was me, honestly, uh, who like, whenever they thought of something, they got into something, they read everything they could about it, uh, and you know, just tried to understand everything. That's Kara Walker. Um, so she'll get kind of obsessed with things uh, and then integrate them in her work. So she's inspired by J.M.W. Turner uh, and um, a book that Turner was also inspired by, Liverpool and Slavery, an historical account of the Liverpool African slave trade. So next image is particularly disturbing. Um, this is J.M.W. Turner's The Slave Ship, slavers soaring overboard, the dead and dying tofoon, typhoon coming on. Uh, and Turner is referring to Liverpool and slavery, a historical account of Liverpool African slave trade, uh, which first appeared in magazines as stories and it was a book. Um, and what it was about was um, the kind of officials, uh, official policies towards slavery in the UK. Uh, James W. Turner was a British artist. Um, and uh, what actually happened. Um, so in the UK, um, it was officially uh, against the law for um, in the 19th century for British people or British companies to be involved in any way in American chattel slavery. Um, and this was like kind of a recognition, recognition of basic human rights uh, and the brutality of it. That was the official stance, um, but it was not really enforced uh, because uh, the British economy, which was at this time uh, the most powerful and expansive empire that ever existed in the world, uh, saw that there was resources and wealth to be gained uh, by getting involved with the slave trade. So many um, British insurance companies got involved uh, with it, where they were insure slave ships. And they did it in a particularly brutal way. Um, they would insure the slave ship, and if the slaves uh, had come to shore, you know, then everything was fine. You know, they collected their, their, their premium. But if there was a problem, um, and the um, slavers had to collect um, their insurance, uh, there was very specific stipulations. And one of them was that they would not cover, and I'm putting the quotes up, damage, uh, but they would cover loss. Uh, so seeing this in a very like strictly economic fashion. Um, and so how slavers responded to that is if there was a storm um, and the ships would be packed with slaves uh, in where the slaves were underneath at the bottom of the ship. If there was a storm and the ship would start taking on water, uh, the slaves would be underneath literally packed in like sar sardines uh, and would often get sick. And then when you got to shore, you would have a lot of sick slaves who they could no longer sell. Um, so um, since they didn't get paid for damage, they only got paid for loss. When this happened, they would just simply throw these the, the slaves, black people, um, out of the boat uh, and overboard. Um, so in this, we can see uh, the ship. Um, the seas uh, are very rough, uh, and black people still chained, thrown in the water, uh, and being consumed uh, by um, sea creatures. Um, so she was inspired by this, and she calls it Grub for Sharks for obvious reasons, showing um, just the complete and total dehumanization of um, black people. Uh, but again, she sees like resonance in modern times uh, with the effects of this dehumanization. So she says, um, however, there's suspicion, my own perhaps, that the trouble with historical slavery, race, and social inequity is that it's so irresolute and so mind-bogglingly personal that just broaching the subject leads to a reiteration of its terms. Therefore, in this paranoid vision, I become the house servant to the institution, throwing the Negro populace a bone. Grub for Sharks is intentionally ambiguous and earlier referenced the act of throwing sick and dying slaves overboard, perhaps my offering to the institution, perhaps the institution's offering to a hungry, underrepresented audience, a concession, a hunker down and do as I am instructed, do so dutifully even, and give you a coupon, a free pass. 
enter at your own risk. So she's saying a bunch of things here. Uh, she's recognizing, first off, that Catch-22, uh, the artist would have, uh, but she's also recognizing her own responsibility in working with what she has. Um, so she's talking about herself as um, giving artwork um, to black audiences uh, that gets them to deal um, with um, issues that are very personal and physical to them. Um, and also recognizing that through this, there is a danger in that she's giving an offer to white audiences, a coupon to be able to um, experience uh, the exploitation of black bodies um, without consequence. Um, so just to take a, a bit of a detour to explain to you what I mean by this, um, if you think about black movies uh, that are critically acclaimed, uh, one of them was 12 Years a Slave. Uh, slave movies are often very critically acclaimed uh, and the black actors in it will win awards. Um, but a lot of black people, rightfully so, saw this as a problem. They said, um, what about these movies where, um, you know, kind of like positive things happen in the movies or it was just like a regular, about a regular black family, but it had this like kind of beautiful uh, stories going on and there was like really complex things. Like why aren't any of these movies getting nominated for awards? Why are the movies where black people are getting tortured and a white audience, in this case, an institution capitalized, like Walker is talking about the Academy, why did they lionize these particular types of movies? Um, so part of the theory of why this is comes from a theory that Walker is, is um, indirectly referencing called Afro-pessimism. Um, it basically talks about the psychological, physical effects of um, slavery, both on white people and on black people. Um, this idea of being able to control black bodies and do whatever you want with it uh, is enticing to people, even to people who don't um, practice, um, you know, the brutal type of racism that they're seeing in the imagery. But because of white supremacy and the way that, that um, white people are generally trained to see black people as lessers or as the only people that can help them, um, they'll have this like kind of like delight in seeing um, black people helpless, uh, even being tortured. So that's part of what she's talking about. She's the house servant. Um, slaves who worked in the house as opposed to the fields were thought to be better off, um, but also they had to do that through a certain amount of brown nosing. Um, so um, from the perspective of white people, they would um, look at the house servant and say, this is the way you're supposed to be, uh, but other black people would recognize that there's compromises that come with that, uh, and that means losing a bit of um, yourself. Uh, to the institution, but people do it for obvious reasons because it makes your life better. Um, but throwing the Negro populace a bone, so looking at the people out in the fields that have harder lives uh, and giving them something to chew on. Um, but she's also talking about perhaps my offering to institution. She recognizes that she's working in a completely white dominated institution. Uh, and that's the case with the arts uh, and institutions um, in the United States in general. Uh, and even in the international art world. So offering a hungry, underrepresented audience. She's talking about black people there. But the concession, um, she's doing this dutifully, give you a coupon, a free pass to enjoy um, vicariously the suffering of black people or just get a voyeur's look into the problems, um, issues, um, both positive and negative of black people. So enter at your own risk. Uh, and so she's kind of like, in a way, she's challenging white audiences uh, to take responsibility uh, for themselves. But um, coming from Afro pessimism, she doesn't necessarily think that that's going to happen. So I know it was a complex one, but hopefully it makes a little bit more sense. So um, she's talking about the seeming contradictions 
uh, which are kind of difficult. So had positive imaging of the black body to date solved the problem of representing blackness and power, thereby ceasing the need for further discussion of the issue, the black and white bodies in my work would be virtually silent. Unfortunately, repeated denials of racist stigmas have not killed them. Uh, so this is a response to extreme times for extreme heroes. Uh, and that was an essay, it was written anonymously, but I, I think Walker knows who it is now, uh, by a black woman. Uh, and she had t said things about this type of work um, and she, uh, the writer was coming somewhat from um, a respectability politics um, type of form, but also just from things uh, where she knew that black people would understand some of these issues in one way and white people would understand in another way. And that contradiction uh, she felt was dangerous. Um, like black people would understand um, you have to do what you have to do. Um, so, you know, and you have to deal with feelings that, of difficult situations uh, in ways that, you know, aren't always, uh, that seem contradictory. But white people would just, you know, get this like vicarious delight in violence against black people. But uh, Walker was uh, a little angered or uh, perturbed by this particular essay because then the essay writer went into um, Walker's life uh, and tried to psychoanalyze her and say, uh, well, Walker has this white boyfriend and they probably play like slavery uh, in the bedroom uh, scenarios. Uh, and she's probably coming from this, this like uh, Stockholm type of syndrome where she secretly uh, wants to be raped by white people. Uh, so um, she like kind of set aside uh, the psychology by saying, it's more than that and I'm responding to other people and like, you don't know me basically. Uh, but she also responded that, you know, this imagery, yeah, white people are going to see it, uh, but um, it's not going to make it go away or make the feelings go away. Um, for her, she feels like she has to get this out. Uh, so I'll show a couple of videos of her work, which you can check out uh, where she talks about her work and where she's coming from and where she's going. Um, so positive absolutes have served to romanticize an essentialist African-American body politic easily captured, negated, and even ridiculed by a dominant white discourse as myriad hypocrisies befall impossible expectations of righteousness. Uh, so she's partially referencing um, with impossible expectations of righteousness. Uh, she's referencing um, black respectability politics, uh, the idea that just being so perfect uh, you can um, bring black people up and therefore somehow solve the problems of racism. Uh, and there was an interesting, uh, just to explain this further, article I'd read a few years ago in the Washington Post uh, where um, it was written by a black man. Um, him and his wife uh, were professionals, really well off. Uh, they had two kids, they were both black. Uh, they lived in the D.C. area, which at this, this time was thought to be, you know, liberal. I'm putting the quotes up, whatever you think that means. Um, and he thought, uh, and he taught his children, he's like, okay, uh, I'm just going to have them dress like super nerdy. Uh, they're always going to look like clean and fresh press, uh, and everything sharp and perfect, uh, and letting his son know, like, you know, walk, um, very slowly and, and, you know, try to, try to, um, look purposeful and not scary. Uh, and he thought that he could protect his children. Uh, but he recognized, uh, and he wrote a whole article about this. This is what I'm doing. Then, uh, I think it was about 10 months later, I wrote another article. And that article was to talk about why he was wrong. Um, he talked about, um, despite all of this, uh, that his son um, in this liberal but still white-dominated city uh, had experienced... Um, racism when he was walking to school, uh, some, sometimes for children, but a lot of times from adults. Uh, it had been harassed by police, even though he's eight years old. Uh, and he realized uh, that doesn't work. Uh, we have to make systematic change. Uh, so he started from a place of respectability politics and went to something that was more complicated. Um, so that's what she's talking about, again, with these impossible expectations or righteousness. Uh, that they don't work. Uh, and um, with these ones, she's talking about, uh, this is like kind of complex, uh, but things like uh, uh, Afrocentrism, uh, which uh, has some like really solid scholarly work on one hand, and then other work that's like this strange kind of like mirror 
uh, to white supremacy, where white supremacy looked at African cultures like the Africa, like the uh, Egyptians, and said, "Oh, that's white," uh, and then um, you know looked at societies like the Greeks as they came up with everything on their own and weren't influenced by Africa at all. Um, and then on the other hand, the Afrocentrists would do this like it's not reverse racism because it doesn't exist, but a kind of like um, uh, photographic negative of that where they would say, no, all of this stuff was done by black people and all of the famous ancient Greeks were black. Uh, so that's what she's talking about with this easily captured and negated or even ridiculed by a dominant white discourse. Um, that these um, types of views, which are coming from, um, you know, white people like it, but coming from um, a bourgeois perspective uh, when black people do it, um, so highly educated, uh, generally well off, um, and just being, as she says, myriad hypocrisies. So um, obviously not the case with everyone, and these types of issues are, are kind of like, Kara Walker turned out to be um, more in tune with the way that people think now uh, than when she was originally making the work. So at this historical juncture, consideration of the production of visual meaning can engage the fascination with objection by enunciating the desire, contradiction, misperception, and fantasy that fuel history and society. Still, racist icons like resistant new strains of bacteria inhabiting the body linger in our collective American minds. The shadow of the racist icon is the dormant form of the virus. Uh, so with this, and again, 13th is very helpful when they talk about imagery um, and stereotypes towards black women and black men and how they function in modern times uh, and what their origins are. That's what she's talking about. Like these images uh, and the associations are still affecting black people, uh, not just mentally and psychologically, but physically, uh, quite literally, uh, if you think of like police shootings against black men. Um, so she's also getting the contradictions. Uh, historical accuracy, like its documentation, panders to subjective, even corrupt desire, anthropomorphizes racist icons' battle for the artist and the viewer's soul. This is an historical drama by the subversive hand of a mediated black body set in betraying our confines, misinterpreting, uh, interpreting uh, appropriate morsels of a lived reality, and delighting in the uncomfortable repositioning of taboo, pride, decency, and power. Um, so in this one, she's talking about the mediated black body. And again, that's something that com comes from um, kind of like black liberation theory, uh, but also from, from specifically Afrocentrism, the idea that um, there's these expectations, uh, there's your person um, and what's around your person. Uh, and there's a contradiction between those two. So you're kind of forced to mediate um, your identity uh, through both. Uh, in a way that people from dominant cultures don't have to. Um, so uh, she's talking about that, but also misinterpreting appropriate morsels of live reality and taboos. Um, so this is where I see most white people, and I'm a white person myself, but um, this is how I see most white people misinterpreting her work. Uh, they look at um, subversive uh, and they stop there. Uh, so they look at um, Walker's work and they say, it's subversive. Um, she's just taking these negative images and repositioning it for her own power. Uh, if you say that, uh, you would be very, very, you would be simplifying her work um, because she's talking about misinterpreting appropriate morsels of liberality, taboo, pride, decency, and power. She's talking about how the brutality of slavery, uh, the sometimes brutality of modern life for black people, leads to these contradictions where um, you can. It's almost like an embracing of um, this type of violence or getting to um, enjoy things on a certain level because you have no other choice. Uh, so this difficult contradiction, and especially that's why I think she's fond of showing um, slave rape as, as sometimes showing it as um, a um, kind of mutual kind of flirtation and at other times it's showing it as violent expressing this contradiction of how people have to deal with it uh, in impossible situations. So to continue with that, uh, she kind of like fantasizes that people might want to go back to that because it's so imprinted on their psychology. Uh, so uh, Darky Town Rebellion, uh, fabricating a very brief pictorial narrative around the idea of a revolution among black women, the reinstitution of slavery, and the abandonment of reason. Naturally, it's drawn from life. 
Um, so this difficulty in um, liberation um, when you've been programmed um, by society uh, and by physical effects of society, uh, that's, that's not something you can have. Um, so this is something she deals with through time, uh, and you can probably understand why I put the air quotes up. She's a controversial artist, uh, but for her, she feels like she needs to. So speaking of that, she did this, and I'll include a, another link to a video where you can see a little bit about a subtlety, um, and you can get into what her work is, what is happening with her work nowadays. Um, so when you see this particular one, um, Kara Walker knew when she was going to make this what was going to happen. Uh, this is in Brooklyn, a uh, heavily gentrified area of Brooklyn, uh, which is most of Brooklyn nowadays. Uh, she knew who was going to be coming to her shows. It was going to be a whole lot of uh, well-off white people uh, and or art students and such. Uh, and she knew there would be you know, black and brown people, but a whole lot of white people. And she knew that they would take this image where she did mixed imagery from the mammy image uh, that was used to portray black women uh, during uh, slave times as a very particular um, type of figure, uh, almost, you know, the, you can look that up. Like a good thing to look at is uh, Gone with the Wind. Uh, you'll see the mammy figure in that. Um, and then portraying her as um, an Egyptian sphinx. Uh, so an obvious kind of like power versus um, the attempt at power, powerlessness uh, contradiction there. She knew that when people came there, because it was 2014, that the first thing they would do is they would come to the show and they would pull out their phone and take a selfie or, or have their friends take a picture of them in front of it. And she knew the problem with white people doing that sort of thing. Um, and it's exactly what she was talking about with giving white people a coupon, um, but kind of eliciting that uh, in, in some ways is kind of the point for her. Uh, to illustrate how much farther uh, things need to go uh, and just dealing with the contradictions she sees herself. Um, so I'll, I'll include this video uh, and you can check it out. So the last artist we're going to talk about, and unfortunately the last thing we're going to talk about in the class because I can't talk about cinema because uh, I can't get a video up there with um, even, I can't record a video with Zoom that has any movie clips in it. So we're kind of stuck. Uh, and we're going to end with Candy Wiley. And appropriately, this is the first artist that is younger than me, a few years younger. Uh, and Wiley was born in Los Angeles. Uh, and again, if you remember, Los Angeles has a limited black community. Uh, same thing with Oakland and California, but generally not a lot of, um, not many black communities in California. Uh, he had an interesting um, childhood. Uh, his father, oh, and by the way, he lives in South Central Los Angeles. Uh, his father is Yoruba, uh, so if you remember from mostly Nigeria and West Africa. Uh, and his mother was Black American. And his father kind of like um, left and went back to Nigeria. It's something that happens with a lot of um, immigrant families. Um, you know, uh, someone who's doing well. Uh, doesn't want to deal with uh, the new society and, and wants to go back uh, to where they were. Um, so uh, he was kind of fatherless for a while. Uh, he met his father in Nigeria at the age of 20. Uh, and he had an urge to meet him. He was kind of aware of what problems there could be with that. It didn't go so well. It didn't go so bad either. Um, by that time, uh, Wiley had understood that he was gay and he got the feeling his father might not have been um, a big fan of that, um, but kind of moved on. Uh, when he was young, his mother uh, recognized, well, this kid, uh, he, he's probably something special. Uh, so she tried to, to kind of like get as many opportunities as she could for him. He studied in a Russian art school at the age of 12 uh, and he was able to visit the Hermitage, which is uh, one of the largest museums, art museums in the world with this incredible um, collection in Moscow with this incredible collection of especially Baroque and Romantic art, uh, which highly influenced him, the, the power and size and uh, being displayed in this artwork. And so he goes to school. I was pretty dead set on being an artist. He gets a BFA from the San Francisco Art Institute in 1999, which just closed this year, unfortunately. Uh, and he took that and went to get an MFA at Yale, which he got in 2001. 
Um, he started to make the paintings for which we're going to look at. He learned some of the techniques uh, at the San Francisco Art Institute, which are kind of very old school, traditional techniques from a Western sense. Um, and then when he moved to Yale, he was you know, pretty mature with those types of artwork that he was making. Um, by the time he graduated from Yale, uh, he was already an internationally renowned artist. I think you'll see why when you see the, the kind of like power of his work. Uh, and the first time I saw him, to give you an idea, was in 2007, uh, and it was in a museum. <laughs> so uh, graduates from graduate school, and he's in a Midwestern town museum within six years. Uh, so uh, quite a mercurial rise, but I think you'll see why uh, his artwork uh, pushes a lot of buttons for people uh, that is very uh, appealing. Um, so the first thing is like, and you can take the extra credit board, it's kind of fun. On the left, you have um, iced tea, and on the right, you have Napoleon. And kind of compare the two, see what's the same, see what's different, see what Napoleon is communicating and how, and see what Ice T, who chose himself this particular image and the pose and what he wore, uh, see what he is communicating. Um, and you know, look at how they deal with communicating whatever you think it is, like power, wealth, um, and see how they each one does it. Um, and you'll get kind of an idea of part of what Wiley's trying to do with this type of imagery. Um, so what he does is he takes these like grand works from the Baroque. Uh, this one is neoclassic uh, with Aang and his portrait of Napoleon and his imperial throne and romantic paintings, especially the big ones that show like power, wealth, uh, you know, the elite society. And um, he finds black people, not usually famous people, but people on the street. And he shows them a bunch of images and says, which one resonates with you, uh, you know, and they'll pick one or, or a few. He'll take photographs of them posing like it and clothes that they chose themselves. He tells them, wear what you want, what you think would look cool, like what you want, how you want people to remember you. Um, and then he makes these extremely detailed paintings uh, in oil uh, with a multi-layer technique uh, similar to the Dutch te technique of paintings. Uh, so there's no shortcuts with this type of painting. It requires thin layers of paint. Uh, Ang is using it here, uh, but it creates this kind of like resonant and warm and somewhat illusionistic type of art. So Wiley likes to keep his intentions ambiguous, comparing himself to a two-faced Nigerian trickster god, Eshu. Uh, so talking about how um, some gods in Yoruba religion, uh, they can kind of like... Um, be beneficial to you by sometimes being a dick to you <laughs> or being funny in a way that's not funny or making fun of you, but then also doing positive things as well. Um, so he kind of looks at himself like that. As an artist and a student of history, you have to be at once critical and complicit to take a stance that says, yes, I'm in love with this magic, the way of painting, but damn, it's fucked up. So in other words, realizing images like this image of Napoleon uh, is often coming from a way to justify imperialism or impression within the countries uh, and um, that they function as propaganda. Uh, but then also saying, oh my gosh, look at the size of these things. They seem to come alive. Uh, there's a lot of power to them. Uh, so this image uh, is the second Wiley I saw in per person. Uh, it's in the Detroit Institute of Art. The men in Wiley's paintings participate in the making of their own representation. Wiley discovers them on the streets of New York where he lives and other cities he visits. Uh, and then he has them come in, post for the pictures. As you can see, this dude wore clean white tee, um, new jeans, Timberlands, uh, all of this stuff. This is how he wanted to be remembered, something to show his arms. Uh, and using this image, um, so again, a kind of like war propaganda image. Um, but putting black men in it. So part of what he sees with this is like a way to um, kind of like rescue the, the infantilizing or animalizing or dehumanizing imagery that had been um, used uh, against black people uh, and kind of going in the opposite direction um, and taking the imagery that the oppressors had used and kind of reclaiming it in a way. 
Um, so this one, Wiley's past exhibition titles, Passing, Posing, and Infinite Mobility, suggests where some of the critique might be directed beyond the obvious biases of traditional European art. They call attention to the fantasy of belonging and the desire of some disenfranchised young black men to blend into mainstream white society by means of name brand consumption. In this way, Wiley uses irony and self-questioning, generally absent from the original sources, to interrogate not just the Western canon, but also the construction of black masculinity. So he's particularly interested in that, and that's why he wants to kind of give people uh, options so we can see, well, what do people want to do? What resonates with them? Uh, what happens when you mix these um, two types of images together? Uh, so one way you might look at both of them and, and you know, it's communicating power. I'll give you the message, but how? Uh, and then how does uh, Wiley's model um, match um, or differ from this? Um, so again, this is the way you kind of understand his work. So sometimes uh, he works with uh, sexual imagery, depending on the model and what they want to do. Uh, so he did a series where he asked men if they'd be interested in doing uh, posts, uh, paintings that were um, using feminine figures instead of masculine figures. Uh, so this one, Femme Piquet, Par en Soupin. Um, <laughs> that's a good Look at the translation. <laughs> My sexuality is not black and white, uh, he said. I'm a gay man who has occasionally drifted. I'm not bi. I have a perfectly pleasant romances with women, but they weren't sustainable. My passion wasn't there. I would always be looking at the guys. So he's kind of like working with like, okay, how can men like uh, embrace other genders, uh, still be um, masculine, uh, but also take on some feminine beauty. Uh, so he's putting flowers in the background. Um, when you look at his work, uh, there are some things going on. I'll kind of talk about his secret sauce a little bit later on. Uh, but if you know anything about painting or have tried to do paintings in a Dutch style, when you make a painting in the style, you have to do an undertone, uh, underneath flesh tones especially. And what that does is it kind of brings um, the blood, the kind of flesh that's underneath the flesh out. And that makes um, a painting of a human being look more real than if you just painted the color on the outside. Um, so generally in Dutch painting, since they're only dealing, they're only interested in um, painting white people. And if you look at Dutch paintings that have black people on it, you'll be like, something's missing there. Uh, and the reason why is because the undertones fit well uh, for most white people, uh, especially Northern and Western Europeans, uh, but they don't work for other people. Uh, so what, why they had to develop is um, undertones that could make black people look as they do uh, to make them, you know, kind of shine from the inside uh, and bring the flesh of black people alive. So this one, you can see how it's kind of like copying this image, um, but still um, a pose that's trying to show this kind of uh, idyllic femininity, uh, but also tragedy, uh, which, you know, people were fond of during the Romantic era in 1847. Um, but, you know, kind of having a strength and still masculinity um, in the pose below. Uh, so kind of showing how gender uh, can work. So Wiley, um, as he became more famous, he did what famous artists do. <laughs> he created a lot more work so he could sell more work. Uh, and like the traditional artists that he makes art like, uh, like say Peter Paul Rubens, uh, he eventually developed a big studio to um, make his paintings. Um, and you notice his paintings are very complex and they have these backgrounds. Um, at first, he was reticent to share like how the paintings were getting finished and how much work was being done um, by um, these art shops that he got and he went to Beijing for it, for the same reason that um, other people go to Beijing to get a particular type of skilled labor, labor that costs a lot less than other places. Uh, so. Chinese artists are trained in a very realistic style. Uh, you know, um, Wiley had spent some time in Beijing when he was in school and learned how to speak um, Mandarin and had, you know, got a boyfriend there and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so it was kind of natural for him to go to China. But um, again, his motivation is he's kind of a business now. Uh, so that's a way he can get the best production for the least labor costs. So he used to be kind of reticent to explore 
uh, or let people in on it. I don't want you to know every aspect of where my hand starts and ends or how many layers go underneath the skin or how I get that glow to happen. Uh, again, I'm talking about undertones. It's my secret sauce. Get out of my kitchen. Later times, though, um, more recently, he has shown what happens. And what usually happens is Wiley deals with the figure, uh, especially the flesh tones, and then assistants paint the flowers. Um, so this is very common for artists, but um, again, you can kind of look at Wiley, um, how he's functioning, um, and uh, you know, if you're looking for a way to criticize an artist, I guess you could go there uh, with the particular type of labor exploitation you see with his work. Um, so Wiley, uh, for a long time, only painted men. Uh, he wasn't sure if he was the person to handle women, um, but he eventually did. And his earliest work with women uh, was a little different um, than what you would see from his uh, work with men. Uh, but he's talking about here something interesting and talking about masculinity and femininity and how it deals with art. Uh, and if you study contemporary feminist art, especially in the 70s, uh, you'll kind of see a resonance in what he's saying here. He says, my work is not about paint, he told me. It's about paint at the service of something else. It's not about gooey, chest-beating, macho 50s abstraction. It allows paint to sit up on a surface of subject matter. Uh, it's about paint, he said. Um, so uh, what he's talking about is abstract expressionism, Jackson Pollock, uh, those types of figures. Uh, and how just like literally spewing uh, paint onto a canvas, uh, because it was made by a man, it was his feelings, uh, it would become a great art. Uh, feminist artists, especially in the 70s, uh, said, you know, maybe art should have meaning besides like whatever's going on inside your gut. Uh, maybe you should have meaning with our histories. Uh, it should have meaning that's more relevant to us. Uh, and I think we can do that by creating images that people can see and understand. Um, and that's what he's talking about there. He's like, his paint technique is amazing, but he doesn't want you to concentrate on that. He wants to concentrate on the effect of the images. Uh, so that's what he's talking about with that. The paint isn't the subject. The subject is the subject. Um, so what he did with his first images, you can kind of uh, understand a little bit by comparing, uh, and again, you can see that shimmer, glow, uh, quite amazing when you see it in person. You can compare to what he first did with women uh, to what he had done with men earlier. Um, you can see the men came in their own clothes. Uh, there's somewhat of uh, masculine poses that you generally see. Whereas um, with women, uh, part of the reason is because he's using women's imagery, they're not coming in his own clothes. Uh, he had the fashion design house, Gavarici, uh designed these dresses, uh, fitted them, couture dresses fitted to the models, uh, and had them um, kind of play these parts. So you can kind of understand like, uh, perhaps that could be a problem uh, where um, women are kind of um, being um, shown as dolls. And some of the women were comfortable with this and some were very uncomfortable with this. Uh, and um, we don't see that with men. We see like more of a participation with the men. Uh, there isn't participation in the art sales at all. So um, again... So uh, before I leave... Uh, he eventually uh, changed and you see more recent imagery of women. Uh, I'm guessing he probably talked to some women and said, eh, maybe you should do it a little differently. Um, and he, uh, women come in in their own clothes. Uh, he creates other celebratory type of images uh, where that resonate um, with what black women wanted to see more. Uh, so he's um, definitely an artist that's responsive. Uh, so... That's the last one.